power of heat. Heat is a form of energy, and despite the puny tolerance of heat by life on Earth, there seems no limit to the height temperatures saw in the universe beyond. Cold is altogether different. At zero Celsius, water freezes. At absolute zero, it can get no colder. And that's far, far colder than the coldest place on Earth. In the field of low temperature physics, this is how Nobel laureates explore the science of supercool. The speed at which atoms move is a measure of temperature. This solid is warm because its atoms are vibrating. The colder the temperature, the less they move. At absolute zero, minus 273.2 degrees Celsius, the atoms would stand still. This air is so cold it's turned liquid. In contact with other substances, it'll cool them by drawing out heat. Let liquid air evaporate and it'll liquefy hydrogen. And liquid hydrogen will liquefy helium, cooled to less than five degrees above absolute zero. A Dutch physicist is the first to liquefy helium. Heike Kameling Onez wins the Nobel Prize for Physics. Liquid helium at minus 269 degrees Celsius, boiling in a flask. If vapor is continuously pumped away, the liquid helium will get even colder. It'll drop to within one degree of absolute zero. When using this process, the British physicist John Frank Allen discovers liquid helium becomes a superfluid. Independently, Russian-born Peter Kapitza makes the same discovery and wins the Nobel Prize in Physics. Liquid helium goes superfluid at minus 271 Celsius. With its atoms barely moving, they no longer interact with each other. It's now a single energy state, heat spreading instantaneously throughout. Evidence of boiling subsides. For explaining the weird and wonderful behavior of liquid helium as a superfluid, the Russian Lev Davidovich Lando wins the Nobel Prize in Physics. All viscosity disappears in a superfluid. It flows through the tiniest hole and it spurts like a fountain when a tube is inserted. To test the electrical conductivity of a wire at very low temperatures, it's immersed in liquid helium. In warm conditions, as electrons conduct electricity along the wire, they encounter resistance from vibrating atoms. The warmer the wire, the livelier the atoms, and the more they resist electron flow. But as temperatures drop, so does resistance as the atoms slow down. In some metals, cooled to liquid helium levels, resistance drops to zero. As a piece of mercury wire is cooled, it becomes a so-called superconductor, when all resistance is gone. John Bardeen on the right develops the first workable theory of superconductivity with fellow Americans Leon Cooper and John Schrieffer. It's named the BCS theory after their initials. They share the Nobel Prize in Physics. Passing between these positively charged atoms is a negatively charged electron tailgated by another. It happens over and over, the first electron attracting atoms inwards. Before they spring back, they create a positively charged region that pulls in the second electron. This way, paired electrons flow unhindered through a superconducting metal. So far, superconductivity is seen only in a few metals and alloys. Then a breakthrough with ceramics. It's discovered that some become superconducting at much higher temperatures, meaning cheaper liquid nitrogen can replace liquid helium as the coolant. High temperature superconductors have arrived. As this one is immersed in liquid nitrogen, resistance quickly falls. Were electricity passed through at zero resistance, the current would flow unhindered, and it would continue with little loss even after the source was switched off. 
For discovering the first high-temperature superconductor, a metal oxide ceramic, two men share the Nobel Prize in Physics. The German physicist, J. George Bednors, and the head of the unit he joined in Switzerland, the native-born K. Alex Muller. Superconductivity is discovered at ever higher temperatures. It's now past minus 115 Celsius and rising. One day, who knows, it may happen at room temperature. That would be cool. And this is pretty cool. An experiment at high school of magnetic levitation. Liquid nitrogen is poured into a dish. Rapidly the disc within becomes a superconductor and a magnet levitates. What's happening is that the field lines of the magnet are repelled by the superconductor. They can't penetrate its interior. They bunch as the magnet closes with the superconductor. And the magnet levitates. It's just another strange property of superconductors. And it only works with small magnets. A more powerful magnetic field would penetrate the superconductor. Magnetic levitation is discovered in the 1930s by the German physicist Karl Walter Meissner. Seventy years later, Japan is exploiting superconducting magnets with a levitating train, the maglev. Up to 100 kilometers an hour, the maglev runs on rubber tires. Then, as liftoff speed is achieved, the wheels retract and the train levitates some 10 centimeters above the guideway. Top speeds are over 500 kilometers an hour. The maglev is both levitated and propelled by supercooled superconducting electromagnets. They continue conducting electricity after the supply shuts off, and that saves energy. On the wider scale, energy saving is one of the greatest jobs superconductors can do. Presently, much energy is lost as heat due to resistance in power lines. But now, copper and aluminium are giving way to cables spun from high-temperature superconductors. With their zero resistance, power loss is minimal. Here, a superconducting cable developed in Denmark is installed in Copenhagen. Across the Atlantic, superconducting cables are wired into Detroit's power grid. Cooled with liquid nitrogen, the new lines carry three times the load of copper wires of the same size. In the USA, two-thirds of electrical power is consumed by electric motors, the majority industrial units like this. Enter the smaller, efficient, pollution-free newcomer, a motor built with coils of high-temperature superconducting wire. The compactness of the coils make for a more powerful, less expensive electric motor. They're up to 45% cheaper than conventional motors, and so much lighter. Similar technology is going into ships. Electric motors are replacing steam and gas. A 25 megawatt superconducting unit is one-fifth the size of a turbine. The US Navy is interested. And in electronics, superconductors are forging exciting innovations. For discovering Josephson junctions, the British physicist Brian David Josephson and the American Ivar Gaver win the Nobel Prize in Physics. They share the award with the Japanese Leo Asaki. But what is a Josephson junction? It's a sandwich, an insulator between two superconducting layers, as an electronic switch ten times faster than a semiconductor. The way ahead is clear. Faster, smaller computers, high-speed communication, thanks to the science of supercool.